There's a call and response tradition that goes way back in Christian history to at least the fourth century. It goes like this. Christ is risen. And their response, he is risen indeed. Welcome to St. John's. I'm Andy, our digital minister. Today, we celebrate exactly that that Jesus has risen from the dead and in doing so has won the victory over sin and death. On Good Friday, we focused on the sounds of the cross. Today, those sounds are now heralding a new dawn with birdsong and peace. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're walking in the quiet stillness of the morning. Not even the birds have started to wake. As your breath unfurls before your face in the crisp air, you walk slowly, heading towards the other side of town. There are others walking beside you, but no one is speaking for the weight and heaviness that lies over your task. The only sound, your footsteps and breath. All else is silence. It's been a long and exhausting couple of days as you watched the unthinkable happen and all your hope seemingly crushed in the space of a few hours. Death seems to walk alongside your group as with hanged heads and eyes all out of tears, you make your way to the tomb. The place where your friend and teacher was laid to rest. Grief, sorrow, exhaustion, numb, angry, confused, scared. But then as you turn the corner to see the tomb, the even more unbelievable occurs. And like the first light that streaks across the sky, hope breaks in. It can be hard to place ourselves in the shoes of the women and men who were present for the events of Easter 2,000 years ago to understand the significance of who Jesus was to these people and how much he represented. What is not hard for us to understand, perhaps, is the grief and sorrow, the heaviness that settles on us when someone we love dies. Some of you may not have experienced this yet, but many of you will have felt the grief or fear that comes with the loss or sooner than expected loss of someone in your life. It's not hard to see just how much we try to avoid or delay the reality of death as a society by every possible means. We fear death and what it brings and the questions that can seem unanswerable in its presence. It's this reality, among others, that the story of Easter breaks into to give hope to completely change forever the way we see death and the way death impacts us. And not just for our deaths, but in our lives. The events of Easter give us pause to once again reflect on the significance of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
why this person, Jesus, was so important and how his death and even more unbelievable resurrection changed our world forever. How that third day, early in the morning, broke the silence of death with the song of new life. So I want to start by asking, what's your hope song? The song or music you turn to when you're exhausted, grieving or lost. The music that stirs your heart to courage and your face to lift. Mine is usually in the form of soundtracks from movies I love or that resonate to that deep place that words cannot express. I think of the emotion captured in The Prince of Egypt or in more specifically, The Lord of the Rings soundtrack the mighty contrast from the dark, bleak sounds of Mordor to the bright spring of the Shire. Music that demonstrates the hope that is found in the destroying of the ring, which breaks the power of the enemy. But usually, I love those because they speak to me of a deeper truth and hope that I know already from the story of Easter. And as we open Luke's gospel today, we see the hope song that bursts from the events of Easter Sunday morning, that the epic of the Lord of the Rings is simply an echo of the greatest victory ever won, where death itself, which even the King of Gondor couldn't avoid, is conquered with new life. Today, Luke's gospel shows us three things about death and life. The first is death's once power over us. The second is Jesus's power over death. And the third is hope in new life before and after death. So let's look at that first one, death's once power over us. It's clear that the last thing both the women and men expected on that morning was Jesus's body to be missing, let alone resurrected. Not only do the women seem to try to problem solve the suspicious absence of a dead body in verse two, but the men flatly refuse to believe the women when they tell them all that had happened at the tomb in verse 11. The men go so far as to describe the women's story as nonsense, which is actually a term doctors at the time would have used to describe people who were babbling, insane, or had fever brain. For humanity, death was inevitable and final. It is said that death is the great equaliser of humanity. No matter the life you've lived, the wealth or the poverty, the moral good or wrong, all must face death. For all of us, death is the end of something or everything. And you don't have to look far to see how we try to push back against it in any way we can. Like rumours of famous people asking for their bodies to be frozen after their death in hope that future generations will learn how to revive their frozen dead bodies. The way immortality features in our imaginations and books and fantasies how we seek to delay the signs of aging with new technologies or creams or surgeries, how we despair over the loss of our control and independence, and how deeply we grieve when we lose those we love, as is a very part of us has been broken off. And when we think about death, there are different ways that we can fear it. One of them is insecurity in the uncertainty of what happens after death. Is there an afterlife? Where do I go when I die? Are there pearly gates and how do I know if I'll get in? Do I just cease to exist? Or maybe we fear the brokenness or suffering in the breakdown of our bodies and the frailty that comes along with it, that we will be incomplete and our identity, our personhood is slipping away. My strength and physicality are fragile and that my legacy is incomplete. Or maybe we have a fear becoming lost, that in death we are parted from all that we know and love and must journey this alone, to go into the great unknown, unable to take anyone or anything with us. Will I see my loved ones again? Where do I go now? Death seems to hold a great amount of power over how we live our lives before it and what we believe of it. On the night before Jesus was crucified, Luke tells us about how Jesus went to pray in agony of the knowledge of what he would face. And he said this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
Jesus asked God to deliver him from death. And here we see that it is right to grieve death and feel its destruction and unnaturalness in our lives because of the author of life did grieve it. For all of us, death is the end of something or everything. But on Easter morning, God transformed death into a new beginning. Death was defeated on the third day at dawn. And that brings us to our second point for today, Jesus's power over death. Jesus's body was not in the tomb. It's as simple and baffling as that. Luke even mentions that Peter finds nothing but the grave clothes Jesus would have been wrapped in, lying in the tomb instead in verse 12. So Jesus was either dead and naked somewhere else, his body being moved, which is kind of incredibly gross to consider someone removing the clothes between the decomposing body and their hands, or he was, as the dazzling men said, risen from the dead. Despite the initial human responses to this event, the two men in dazzling clothes that Luke later identifies as angels make it pretty clear what has happened. Look with me to verses five to seven. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Here's the thing. Is the resurrection of the dead completely unbelievable? Even today, with much of the Easter story known from the thousands of years the church has shared it, do we truly have hope in the resurrection or do we think it's impossible? And does it actually mean anything for our lives today if we do or do not believe the story? The earliest confession of faith of what Christians believe says that Jesus truly died, was buried and descended into the dead. He was utterly and completely dead. It's important to understand that the resurrection of Jesus was not a resuscitation of his body. Jesus himself, after losing his friend Lazarus, wept and then resuscitated him from the dead. That was a temporary resuscitation of his body before Lazarus once again faced death. Jesus was truly dead beyond the reach of resuscitation. Jesus was actually, in our recorded history, resurrected from the dead. Our hope song is this. In the resurrection, life triumphs over death. And it is this story that our best epics, movies, novels all seek to emulate. How many times does a main character die or mysteriously disappear, only to reappear at the end to make all right? The resurrection is ingrained into our stories, whether or not we recognize it as Jesus's victory that made that plot line believable. Let's be honest, who is truly satisfied with a story if death is the end? Well, there is no hope in death without the resurrection. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the silence of death was overthrown by the hope song of new life. And this hope song is dependent on something equally as important as Jesus' resurrection, that he was raised Lord Jesus. Luke describes Jesus as Lord in verse 3 when the missing body is first noticed, even before the angels appear to announce the news. Something has occurred in Jesus rising from the grave to reveal the most startling truth about who this Jesus is. We cannot separate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from his lordship and the position God raised him to. And this lordship is not simply over the people of Israel. In Christ's resurrection and later ascension to glory, he became Lord of all. That in his resurrection, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, proudly handed to Jesus the lordship of everything. And it is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus upon which we place all our hope in the victory of life over death. Death is defeated and Jesus is Lord of all. 
So again, we have to ask ourselves, if the resurrection truly happened in history, as I just described, what does Jesus' lordship mean for your life? Does the risen Lord Jesus make any difference to how you live your life? If he is Lord, it should. What he claims is true in his word and how we are to live our lives in response to that should make all the difference to the here and now. And it makes all the difference in our deaths to come. As Christians, we believe that the resurrection not just answers, but transforms those fears of death I mentioned before. Insecurity is transformed to security. The Bible goes on to demonstrate the certainty that those of us who have faith in Jesus and his resurrection will receive eternal life after death can have. That we know exactly where we are going. Brokenness and frailty is transformed to wholeness. A wholeness so complete that it is better than what we had before death entered the world, where the very spirit of God is within us and we are given a new body like Jesus that was given that is called imperishable. And finally, being lost is transformed to being led home. God gives us a family, an identity and a destination to our journey in the person of Jesus Christ. Those who have faith in Christ are promised a home with God forever in never ending paradise and that they would never again be alone or lost. It's a breathtaking transformation from death to life. And these promises are assured and we can have full confidence in them being completed because of God's faithfulness to his promise that he would raise Christ from the dead. Finally, Luke 24, And the story of Easter opens to us our third point, hope in due life before and after death. When I was eight or nine years old, I experienced death for the first time of my living memory. My family was going on holiday, but before we left the city, we went to visit my nana, who was very sick in hospital. She had been sick for all of my life and most of my dad's. Before we arrived, I'm sure my parents warned us that this was probably the last time we would see her because I remember walking in a bit shell-shocked from that truth and unable to wrap my young mind around the possibility of Nana just not being there anymore. I expected to walk in and be deeply uncomfortable with her sickness, but instead I walked in and the room was warm and full of sunlight. Nana was sitting up in bed eating an ice cream, which I later found out was a heaven that she had stole from my granddad. Her and my granddad were smiling and laughing, and there was this sense of peace and joy in the room. I watched my parents as we left the hospital, and again when I saw my dad take the phone call that meant Nana had passed away, that I could see their grief and pain at the loss of Nana. I could see how sad my dad was in losing his mum. What stood out and has shaped me from then on was the sense of hope and even relief for her freedom from suffering that my dad carried in receiving and sharing this news. That this was a temporary separation. And every time my parents or granddad talked about Nana, it was with this conviction that we would see her again. And granddad has already gone ahead of us to meet her. Well, I grew up knowing about God and believing in him, but knowing now the difference this has made to my life cannot be understated. I experienced close death a few more times after that, but it wasn't until much later when I was about 23, when I went to a funeral for someone who didn't know or love Jesus for the first time, that I realized the difference between death with hope and hopeless death. That in life we struggle to find hope apart from Christ and especially in death. Even those who don't want anything to do with Jesus or church seek comfort in the words of the Bible to borrow some of that security, wholeness or home in the death of their loved ones. There is something so profound in hope, in the hope we can have in Jesus Christ and his victory over death, that though death is still a part of our lives, 
It has been emptied of its power. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Through the risen Lord Jesus, we have hope in new life after death. Not resuscitation of this world or this body, but resurrection into life with Jesus that cannot be destroyed or broken. Where true security, true wholeness and my true home awaits. There is hope, then peace, and finally life in death. But this transformation is not only for life after death. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus is our only hope in death and our only hope in life. For those of us who have no Christian faith and do not know the risen Lord Jesus, life and death can be bleak and a devastating experience. It can be hopeless, helpless and deafening in its silence. But those of us who hope in Jesus, neither life nor death are to be feared. We still need to weather death's cost until we ourselves meet Christ or until he calls us home. But our hope song transforms how we live in the now that is actually the beginning of the life we will live on the other side of death. New life starts now. To live each moment believing the truth of the resurrection is the lens of life. Through seeing and believing in his victory over death and what he won for us, we see and receive new life. Are you living each moment in light of this? In your relationships with those around you who don't have this hope, is the resurrection your lens? If you don't know this hope, I encourage you to come and learn about what it means for you here with us at St John's. Come and speak with anyone you've seen during this service or any of our pastoral staff. We want nothing more than to introduce you to the source of our hope, joy and life. The Lord of all, who truly walked this earth, truly died, was truly raised to new life and still lives today sitting on his throne. You can trust him and him alone in all your sorrows and your grief. He is loving and faithful and good where all else fails. He is our true hope song, the risen Lord Jesus, the source of our praises and joy and light during the dark. And I'll finish with this paraphrase of one of the most loved Christian songs of praise for Easter morning. Glory to you, conquering Son and risen Lord Jesus. Your victory over death will never end. Angels clothed in splendour rolled the stone away. They kept your folded grave clothes where your body lay. Look, Jesus meets us, risen from the tomb. He greets us lovingly, scattering our fear and gloom. Let the church sing songs of gladness and triumph. For her Lord is living. Death has lost its sting. We no longer doubt you, glorious Prince of life. What is life without you? Help us in our struggles. Glory to you, conquering Son and risen Lord Jesus. Your victory over death will never end. The Lord Jesus is risen. To God be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Jesus has smashed death and offers a brand new creation, bringing us along with him. Let's celebrate now with the song For All You've Done. Following that, we'll be led in prayers by Robin and Linda, and there'll be a chance for you to creatively respond and participate in that. It'd be good to have some scissors and some paper and a pen uh, ready for that.
Lord Jesus, as the women came to that empty grave, what they expected was not to be. You were not in the tomb, but alive. As we come in prayer to you, open our eyes wide in wonder and belief at your resurrected and divine person living now. Father God, Thank you for your love in freeing us from sin's power by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you, Father, and thank you, Jesus, that you long to give us the gift of your Spirit. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, through your Spirit into our lives and change us. Bring about new life. Do the unexpected and fill us with your love. Where there is our own good works, convict us. Where there is unforgiveness, heal us. Where there is wrong, doing and impurity, make us clean. Give to us, we pray, a renewed belief in the power of prayer because of your resurrection. You make a call on each of our lives, and if it is today, may we say yes in response to you, Jesus. You have made us your children, Father. Help us all through your power to reflect heaven in this broken world. And we await with hope for that day when you return, Jesus, for your complete renewing of all creation. While we wait, we worship, enjoy you, and live our lives for you. Together, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us with all God's people across the world this Easter. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to invite you to a creative response to what we have prayed and what we have heard. A butterfly is a symbol of new life. Um, And here on the table, we've got the, the makings of a butterfly. On one side of the paper, we're going to invite you, if you want to, to write down the things that you are grateful for. One of the responses that I have in to the resurrection is intense gratitude to God for what he has done and the victory he has won. On the other side of the paper, I, we invite you to um, write down where you would like to see God bring new life to you. The resurrection was new life in a an incredible way. And there are parts of us that are sometimes feeling dry or even dead or where the ground seems sour. So if there's any part of your life that you would like God to come and and bring his new life, his resurrection life, we invite you to write that down on, on the other side. If you just want to use a piece of paper to write these down, and put it away and then come back and look at it perhaps in time to see how God has answered your prayers. 
In the meantime, this is how we're going to make the butterfly. You need one piece of paper, one small piece of paper here, with a slit in it. You need a square of paper. I've folded in two so that we can write one prayer here and one prayer there. When you've done that, I want you to make it into a fan. So, and as we're making it into a fan, it is going to turn into the butterfly. Take your fan, pop it through the slit, and open up your butterfly wings. And there you have that symbol of new life. So we're going to give you a few minutes to do that and um, there'll be some music playing. And um, if you don't want to do this but would just like to pray, that's fine too. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest Sun, moon and stars in their courses above Join with our nature in manifold witness To thy great faith So let's pray. Dear Father, in our hands are our prayers. We ask, Father, for you to come and touch and bless these prayers, these prayers from the heart, these prayers that are simple but so sincere. And we ask, Father, that you will accept our gratitude for all that you have done for us and more that we could ever imagine. And we ask, Father, that the resurrection of power of Jesus will come and touch our lives and bring about that new growth, that new life, that abundance, that richness, that growth. Amen. If anything has prompted you this Easter to get to know Jesus better, I'd love to help you on that journey. Reach out to us at stjohnstc.org.au, hit the connect button, and we'll be there ready and waiting. As we offer our prayers as butterflies, let me close our service together today in prayer. God of peace, who brought again from the dead our dear Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good will, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week, Easter weekend. We'll see you again online soon.